Okay, well, I'm sitting here with uh, Andrew Lees, writer and um, one of the world's leading neurologists, uh, Professor Andrew Lees. And we're sitting in the, the so-called Beat Hotel um, in the Rue Gilles in Paris. And we're here for a very specific reason. And that reason is partly because Andrew's the author of this book, Mentored by a Madman, which is um, the William Burroughs experiments, which we're going to talk about. But also as well, this place is a totemic, totemic kind of site in the Burroughs lived and worked here and produced many of his, his ideas. The other thing I'm going to say is that, and I'm not just saying this for the sake of it, this is an absolute corker of a book. Very enjoyable, but also I think very provocative. Andrew, how did you write it and why? I wish I'd written it 30 years earlier, to be honest, because I think it may have had more effect on my colleagues and younger aspirant medical students and doctors. Um, I was frightened to write it because I thought I might be drummed out of the regiment. Medicine's still a very conservative profession, and um, I enjoy being a doctor. Um, I enjoy the companionship and the brotherhood of being in um, the medical profession and the, as I say in the book actually doc, neurologists especially are a little bit like policemen we prefer our own company and uh, the, the thought of being um, evicted from <laughs> that and, uh, uh, was a fate worse than going to prison for me so I was a bit frightened to stick my head over the parapet and uh, say some things that I think would potentially help medical practice uh, then and also perhaps even more so now. It is a kind of memoir, but what I'd like young people to, to kind of take out of the book is that um, they, it could be helpful for them to have a guru or a mentor outside their own particular speciality. Because medicine and particularly medical science is, is quite conventional, I found that I needed some uh, to support me if I rebelled a little bit against it. And I think, I think if, you, if you want to be a good medical scientist, um, then I think you need to, for, certainly you need to stick to your guns. Um, you need to have conviction and belief in what you're doing. And you need to transcend the boundaries of conventional uh, wisdom and question everything. I think Burroughs helped me with this kind of rebellious aspect, particularly in the 60s when I first read him. Um, and I was a very slightly disillusioned medical student. Um, so, so from that, and then uh, I say in the book that I drew up this sort of Faustian pact with him. If I listened to what he had to say about everything in life, but particularly his ideas on science and science fiction, uh, that he'd let me continue in my medical studies uh, rather than drop out. And, and what you've got to say about Burroughs as well is, is, is interesting because, um, correct me if I'm wrong, there is a sense in which Burroughs uses his own body as a laboratory and in a sense that contributes quite directly to your own work on Parkinson's disease. Is that, is that right? Y yes, I, I think he, you know, he did use his, his brain as a kind of petri dish and um, I think that he was quite objective and scientific in his descriptions about the mechanisms of addiction. But, um, I mean, he wanted to collaborate with um, scientists, I think, and I think one of his regrets was that not, none of them would take him seriously. So I, and I tried to do, and I did. There might have been coincidences or intersections, but uh, when, when we were looking for new treatments, um, for Parkinson's disease when we were all beginning to realize that L-dopa, although a very effective treatment, had shortcomings and it wasn't the panacea or the, the cure for Parkinson's disease. We were starting to look around for uh, other complementary treatments that could help some of the problems. And um, I, I, by that time, when, when Burroughs was treated with apomorphine, it wasn't known how apomorphine worked. But by the time, in the eight, early 80s, when these problems were occurring and I'd started my research. Um, uh, it was known that apomorphine did stimulate dopamine in the brain, so it was a powerful dopamine receptor. So I um, kind of thought, well, why is nobody using this? And when I was doing it, it was not long after I'd been appointed a consultant at Queen Square, and I reread The Naked Lunch as I'd, uh, I'd done, I read it 
periodically throughout my career. And the apomorphine stuff and the junk vaccine stuff hadn't really struck me very much when I read it in the 60s as a medical student. I hadn't bothered much mm. with that. I was more interested in laughing at Dr. Benway's antics and so on, and the sort of antithesis of good medical practice. But th this time I reread it and I thought, you know, apomorphine Burroughs is pretty keen on this stuff. So my decision to sort of reinvestigate apomorphine stemmed firstly from rereading Naked Lunch and William Burroughs and paying a bit more attention to his testimony. And then Burroughs kept cropping up in my research all the time. And I found that by listening very carefully to what he said about addiction, he'd actually anticipated um, modern thinking about the neurobiology of addiction. For example, he realized that um, addicts didn't like their drugs, but once you've, your brain has been hooked, even if you've been off the drug for uh, 10 years, uh, you just have one retake re of it mm. and you're hooked again. So the, the, but once the brain has had this repeated use, it, it, it makes a permanent change. In, mm. uh, and he, he talked a lot about sensitization and tolerance, um, which at, at the time he was talking about them were not concepts which were known about in, in psycho psychiatric literature at that time. You use the words coincidences and intersections, and I'm not sure whether it's a coincidence or not that we're actually here in Paris, where as a, as a young um, uh, medical student, you came to study at La Salle, La Salle Patrie Prétrière. Now, I don't want to make the co question more complex, but one of the things that you're telling me about is that science is literature and literature can be science. In a French context, was that also something to do with language, that you had to understand a different linguistic and also intellectual concept of how medicine worked? Well, well of course, Paris is the, the cradle of neurology, and um, Charcot is regarded by most neurologists as the father of neurology. So this is uh, the mecca of, of neurology, and of, uh, particularly in the 19th century, uh, no, doctors interested in nervous diseases came from all over Europe and from the United States to train under Charcot. And the hospital where I went on to train, I came to Paris um, after my house jobs. I mean, like many young doctors, uh, I was finding it hard. I was pretty exhausted after my two house jobs. And I worked here as a junior doctor, seeing patients with nervous diseases. and. Um, what I noticed with the French neurologists as opposed to the British neurologists was that there was perhaps even more showmanship and that they were even more flamboyant than the, the neurologists I'd met during my medical training. Um, th through working with the French physicians, I saw that they made me see things in a different way. A place like Salpetria has its own very specific culture, and we've just had a wander around the Salle de Garde and, and the chapel, and where you, where you did all of your, your, your training and so on. And tell me about that culture, because I think it's very specific. It's a it's a it's a real place where you learn real things. Yeah. So the the Salle de Garde is a a, a place, a residence for junior doctors, and they're, sadly they're disappearing. So, for example, at the National Hospital Queen Square, where I work, we lost our salle de garde many years ago, but it's still hanging on here, fortunately, in Paris. And when I was here, um, we used to have sumptuous lunches there with a bottle of red wine and good food. And uh, if you were on call, uh, you slept the night in uh, the rooms above the, the place, the dining room. Now. Uh, as you saw, t as we saw today, the, the 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 room has been decorated with frescoes painted by drawn and painted by the residents over the the last twenty or thirty years, m many of which are highly pornographic. Rabelaisian. Uh, uh, Rabelaisian <laughs> and uh, uh, an interesting and uh, anatomically inaccurate, uh, as you pointed <laughs> out when we were wa walking around. Um, so, uh, but. On a serious note, I mean, these, these places uh, were a place where junior doctors could discuss medical issues in confidence uh, and uh, 
I, I think that that's something that we now lack. We don't have, a, you know, we have our lunches with, our, with the patients and there's one refectory in the hospital where everybody goes to eat. So you can't, you can't talk shop or you can't talk mm. business. And th those kind of places, I think, were quite uh, useful, certainly during my training. And I, when I was in Paris, I, I went there so uh, times and I learned a lot by just talking to junior colleagues there. Uh, it's always had this um, very large chapel, uh, the, the St. Louis Chapel at the, at the center. So if you see any pictures of the South Patria, this sticks mm. out about above everything else. And when I was there, um, uh, occasionally when I was feeling a bit sorry for myself or I thought I'd made a terrible mistake, which happened quite frequently, I would go into the chapel and particularly it's, it's divided into a lot of different areas and sit uh, in the chapel where it says Saint Teresa um, of Lisieux uh, is her chapel is and just sit there and have a quiet moment you know so it was quite quite a nice play and I think that that's another thing which has kind of got squeezed out a lot in hospitals a place where people can worship or go to pray if they have faith faith rooms if you like in, in, in hospitals, um, uh, wh which I think is a pity because I think they were kind of a, a help uh, for many people and they were uh, not, not just for the doctors who are having to see all these difficult things all the time, but, but to bereaved relatives. Um, so I, I spent a bit of time there too, as well as uh, on the wards in the hospital. Um, we talked about Burroughs as a literary man as an artist making a contribution to medical science but I've got to say as well this is a terrific memoir you're a man of science who's made literature it's a very 18th century thing to do isn't it yes yeah yeah it's and it's nothing new really I mean I think um, uh, man, many people have talked about trying to bring art and science closer together um, and many doctors uh, are frustrated writers because um, and, and they don't want to write about medicine always, they want to write about other things. Uh, one, of, one of my teachers I mentioned in the book recommended that I read Marcel Proust, uh, La Recherche du Tom Perdu, and the complete works of Sherlock Holmes when I started in neurology. And of course Proust uh, knew most of the neurologists in the Salpetria Hospital. And Sherlock Holmes, uh, of course, well, Conan Doyle was a a physician, he gave up being a doctor to to write. Uh, so, so there is this the, there is this link. So yeah. it's not as separate as we think. Burroughs wanted to study medicine. Yeah. Yeah. André Breton, great surrealist, had started yes. his career as a yeah. medical student. Yes, you know. I, I sort of see. I didn't realize this until I finished the book. But there's a sort of inverse relationship between my career and Burroughs. I mean, Burroughs started off actually wanting to be a doctor and uh, enrolled to do medicine in, at the University of Vienna, but dropped out after uh, a few months and, and took up writing and uh, self-experimenting and so on. Um, whereas the, uh, the opposites kind of happened to me, uh, but he's kept talking to me. So I, I, I followed the conventional path. I went into medicine. Uh, I've done neurology all my life, but as I've got older, I've kind of started to self-experiment with drugs um, be a bit more adventurous uh, and start to write. So I, I'm kind of the other way around from him. So I, I, I see that kind of, I mean, I don't want to compare myself with him, but, but there's, there's this kind of uh, symmetry and uh, inverse symmetry. Yeah, I mean, I, I think this is this is very interesting that we're in Paris, we're, we're, we're in the Beat Hotel where Burroughs did all of these things, we're just down the road from where you did all your stuff in La Salle Petriere. And I'm going to read the quotation from the beginning of the book because I think it tells us about this, this art, science, literature uh, and medicine. And this is the quotation, this is from Burroughs. The time has come for the line between literature and science, a purely arbitrary line, to be erased. Very Burroughsian phrase, but very important to you, no? Yes, yeah, yeah, and um, I, I think uh, anybody who wants to be a good doctor sh shouldn't restrict themselves to just reading about science and neurology. They need to broaden their field into literature and art and so on. I mean, we, these, these are very important um, 
uh, unrecognized influences in being yeah. a, in in the magic of being a good doctor. 